Yes, I will do that. So our guest this evening is Jeff Hahn. And to most of us, he needs no introduction because he's presented to us many times and it's always some, we're always happy to see him uh, because he has the latest and greatest information on what insects we should be paying attention to and what advice we can give to our uh, constituents. Uh, Jeff, is, Jeff specializes in urban insects, especially those found in landscapes, gardens, and structures. And he provides insect pest management information through a variety of educational programs and web-based information to many audiences. And we are only one of his audiences, so we feel very privileged that he's with us here tonight. Take it away, Jeff. All right, well, let's, uh, I'm gonna need to share my screen. So I've done this before, so in theory, this should work. Yeah. And that's looking good. All right. Well, thank you for inviting me to uh, talk with you. Um, if I haven't talked to you in a Ramsey County program, I may have talked to you in a core course at some point. And uh, Boy, what, what a great day to actually be doing this on Zoom. I think we generally don't like this. We'd rather be face-to-face, -face, but on this snowy evening, maybe it's just as well we're all safely uh, at home. So uh, today's program or tonight's program is gonna be on invasive landscape insects. And invasive insects is something we have dealt with forever. Um, and we have essentially always have invasive insects of some sort but it seems like they are coming faster and faster. We're turning around and always seeing new invasive insects. So I think this is a really good opportunity to kind of take stock of what's out there. What do we know already? And maybe what can we learn about invasive insects in the landscape that are here in Minnesota or perhaps threaten Minnesota? And, and so just to put us all on the same uh, page, an invasive insect, is a non-native insect. Now we have other non-native insects. Um, honeybees actually are a non-native insect, but it's a combination of a non-native insect that does significant damage. That makes it invasive. So that is what we're going to talk about today. So I have divided the insects we're going to discuss into one of three groups, uh, according to how long they've been in the state. So the first group we're gonna talk about are those that are established, or in other words, they, they have a very strong foothold uh, and they're not going anywhere. And probably an insect that needs very little introduction is emerald ash borer. And this is an insect uh, that was first found in Minnesota in uh, 2009 and uh, uh, in Ramsey County. It is now found in 25 counties uh, if you have been reading the newspaper, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Minnesota Department of Agriculture announced that it was uh, now in Sibley and Carver County. So that brings it up to 25 counties. And so uh, while 25 counties out of like 82 or 83 may not seem like a lot, on the other hand, uh, once they get into a county, uh, they're, they're not being uh, eradicated. And there's absolutely no reason that they're not gonna spread to every single county eventually. So we would call them established. So, uh, and this is hopefully familiar to most of you. Um, emerald ash borer attacks all true ash. So in other words, all fraxinous species. And here in Minnesota, the primary species are black, green, and white ash. And you can see here that they're all highly susceptible. Um, Blue ash is actually so some tolerance, but we don't grow very much blue ash here in Minnesota. And Manchurian ash is, vac is actually very, very tolerant, but that of course is not a native ash. Now I did stress true ash because we have things like mountain ash, which is a sorbus. So that's not a true ash. Emerald ash borer has no interest in uh, something like uh, a mountain ash. So part of what I want to do tonight is make sure you can recognize these invasive insects and recognize their damage. And so, although you probably have heard discussion about emerald ash borer, I want to uh, go through it again. 
Uh, this is a, a fairly small insect, a third to maybe up to a half inch in size, fairly slender. It kind of gently tapers. So the widest part is right behind the head and kind of tapers to the tail end, which is the narrowest part. Of course, what really stands out is the iridescent green color. Now, if that was the only green insect that we saw in Minnesota, uh, then that would be easy to recognize. But unfortunately, we do have other green insects. And you can see kind of a handful of them here. Uh, we have some, actually insects that are the same shape, maybe not the same color. So uh, immediately to the right of the emerald ash borer, we see bronze birch borer and two-line chestnut borer, very closely related species. Um, they're a similar shape, but of course they lack the color. Probably the insect that gets thought of as emerald ash borer the most often <clears throat> is the uh, six-spotted tiger beetle, which is in the bottom row, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and all the way to the right. And uh, that's green, iridescent mm -hmm. green, so it's a very similar color. They're, they're a similar length. Uh, okay. Six-spotted tiger beetle might be slightly longer, but that's, that's not a good way to identify it. But you look at the shape, and the shape is quite different. Um, the emerald ash borer is, is just gradually tapers down, whereas with the six-spotted tiger beetle, you see a really large head with big eyes, then it kind of narrows behind that, and then it kind of gets larger again. Six-spotted tiger beetles are typically on the ground and move very fast, so hopefully we would uh, those would be good ways to uh, distinguish them. Um, you may be more likely to see the larvae and uh, they're a very flat bodied insect. And in fact, this group of insects are called flat um, headed borers. And uh, if you were to flip it over, you would see there would be no legs. And when we look at where the head is, um, the head is not very conspicuous. If you were to compare that to say like a caterpillar, you can see a really obvious head. With emerald ash borers, the head is really kind of buried in the front of the body. If you look closely, you can kind of see dark colored mandibles sticking out, but really not much more. Now to help distinguish emerald ash borer larvae from other native borers, look at the tip of the abdomen. So in the lower picture, all the way to the left where it's circled, we see two little tails um, two little pinchers that kind of stick out. And that is very typical for emerald ash borer and other similar insects. But if you're looking at ash, no other native borer is going to have that uh, combination of, of features. And so now we, we can identify emerald ash borer, but the reality is we are probably most likely going to find an infestation from symptoms in a tree. So the, your first step might be, well, we'll just look at the canopy. Well, actually, the canopies are not a good way to identify emerald ash borer infested trees. If we look at the left hand picture, uh, if I were to say, does this have emerald ash borer? You'd say, no, nah, probably not. Uh, but the reality is it does, but you can't tell from the canopy. Ralph Breeder is our local food shelf, and we do. Yeah, um, if you have, if, if you're not muted, please mute so. So um, that doesn't happen. There were 17. And so the, the tree on the right, although the canopy does not look good, um, actually does not have emerald ash borer, although we might guess that it does. Other symptoms, uh, uh, so the good symptoms to look for, there, there's several. And, and probably one that is the most helpful is a woodpecker pex, because woodpeckers love emerald ash borer larvae. And so if you see a tree, and especially as the leaves come down, uh, the woodpecker pecks are more obvious. And in the tree in the previous slide that had the full canopy, the uh, emerald ash borers were actually found from woodpecker pecks. Now, another symptom to look for are vertical bark splits. And so you can see a crack going from top to bottom. And that by itself is, is maybe not definitive. Just like with the woodpecker pecks, they could be doing that for other reasons, but it's really a red flag that would cause you to look more closely. Now in the bark crack picture, if you look underneath it, you can just make out some S-shaped galleries. And anytime you can see S-shaped galleries, whether it's with the bark peeled off or, or through a crack like that, that is definitive for emerald ash borer. 
Another uh, insect that we would consider uh, perhaps established, or it's kind of on the line between established and, uh, and emerging, would be gypsy moth. But it certainly is an insect that has been in our state for, for a really long time. It was first found in 1969. Uh, the first uh, infestation in the landscape was in 1980. And uh, so we've, we've been battling this now for, for actually a pretty good long time. Fortunately, they're not in as many counties, uh, certainly not like what we see with emerald ash borer. And uh, what this diagram, this map is showing is where traps were set out last year and then uh, how many uh, gypsy moths were caught in these traps. And so not every county necessarily gets a trap, but every county that had some uh, from the previous year will get a trap. And then they kind of uh, MDA rotates it kind of throughout the state. So everything gets examined at, at one point. Um, now, where we have the most gypsy moth is actually up in the Arrowhead region. And so uh, if we look up here in uh, uh, Cook County and then in Lake County, uh, in 2014, they trapped tremendously large numbers of gypsy moth and actually put those counties under quarantine. So there are restrictions as to moving firewood and other uh, wood products out of there. Uh, so you can try to minimize spreading it. But otherwise, for the most part, we find gypsy moth in the eastern part of the state. So from the Arrowhead through the Twin Cities down to the southeast part of the state. Now, uh, gypsy moth actually likes about over 300 different kinds of plants. And so despite that, there are some things they're not real fond of. Um, ash trees, ironically, uh, some evergreens, um, dogwood, uh, some other, th other plants as well. Uh, larger larvae will feed on, uh, um, you know, many things. Uh, they can also tolerate things like a box elder, black walnut, cottonwood. Uh, the trees that all stages will be quite happy to eat would include things like oak, aspen, willow, uh, different kinds of birch. And, and of course, we have lots of those here in Minnesota. So no shortage of trees for gypsy moth. And the damage that gypsy moth causes is they, they chew leaves, they defoliate trees and shrubs. And so a good way to think of this is uh, forest hand caterpillars. Uh, forest hand caterpillars do a really similar thing. Uh, a healthy tree in one season is not gonna get injured or killed. But if you have a tree that's unhealthy and not doing well, complete defoliation one year by gypsy moth is enough to kill it. If you have healthy trees, um, as I said, in one year, they're not going to be injured, but if they're defoliated severely, and that can easily happen in an outbreak of gypsy moths, three, four, five years in a row, and they're going to do some serious damage and uh, could very well kill them as well. Now, they also can be a nuisance, and if you have ever been in a forest and caterpillar outbreak, um, gypsy moths will do the same thing when they have outbreaks, and uh, you'll get hunks of leaves falling down, you'll get droppings falling down, Caterpillars will crawl all over on the ground and on furniture, sides of buildings, et cetera. And gypsy moths can defoliate, I mean, many thousands of acres of, of trees once they get a foothold and, and cause problems. We're not facing that so far, um, or at least only on a limited basis. Uh, but that is potentially what can happen as they become more and more established here in Minnesota. So let's take a look at how we would identify gypsy moth. Uh, you can see it's kind of hairy. That's not really that great of a feature because we're gonna see another slide that there are lots of caterpillars that are hairy. So that's not, uh, that's not anything that's gonna to be too helpful. It has kind of a black and white head that can be kind of helpful. I don't see too many caterpillars that look like that. What's gonna really stand out are these two rows of spots that go down its back from the head to the tail. And we have actually 11 pairs of these spots. The first five are blue, and then the next six are red. So you're not gonna see any other caterpillar with that combination of spots. Now these are some native caterpillars and things that I will get questions about. Thinking, uh, could this be a gypsy moth? And you can see they're all kind of hairy. So that's why I said that's not really a good feature to use. Um, 
when we looked for the blue and red spots, the, but the only insect that has any red on it at all is the spiny elm caterpillar on the top. And that's just one single row of red spots and there are no blue spots. Uh, Eastern tent caterpillar kind of has some blue spots, uh, but again, uh, the combination of red and blue is what you want. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that gypsy moth does not make webs of any sort. So sometimes I get people asking about fall webworm and uh, Eastern tent caterpillar and wondering if those could be gypsy moths. And partly I think they're looking at the webbing, but of course, Eastern tent caterpillar makes the webbing in the forks of the branches in the springtime. And the fall webber makes the webbing at the ends of the branches uh, in, the, in the late summer and the fall. So webbing, not gypsy moth. And again, I, I think when you put them side by side, it's a lot easier. But uh, for the public who is not as familiar with the different caterpillars, uh, you know, they're going to ask. And so that will help you when you may be helping out someone with that kind of question. All right, well, the next category we're going to discuss, and this will be kind of a bigger section, and that is the emerging invasive insects. And so emerging means that we have found it in Minnesota, but they are, are not very established. We've only found them in just a few places, and, uh, uh, and they likely can be in more, but we've just not gotten to that point, uh, at least not right away. So the, the first insect we'll talk about is brown marmorated stink bug. And uh, this is an insect that uh, might be getting a little bit more familiar with people. We found this for the first time in 2010 in Minnesota. It was actually found in the US in the 1990s in Pennsylvania. And uh, it really is in pretty much every state in the country. There's just a handful of states, but it is widely distributed. And a big reason for that is because it can be easily moved. Uh, in vehicles and boxes, packages, et cetera. I mean, I've heard stories of RV campers, you know, going across the country full of brown marmorated stink bugs. So it's not hard to see how they can, uh, you know, get taken to other places rather easily. When we look at where brown marmorated stink bug is in Minnesota, we see it's pretty clustered in the Twin Cities. And that is where we first found it. And it is pretty much in the entire metro area. Um, but when we start looking at other places, it's actually in about 24 other counties in Minnesota. And so, and, and again, because it can be easily moved, it's not going to take, um, it's, it's not going to take a big effort for them to continue to be found in other counties. Let's talk about how we would recognize brown marmorated stink bug, because there are some native stink bugs that we will confuse. And so I, I got a good place to start here is to make sure we have a stink bug because we're going to look at some lookalikes, things that we can confuse that are not actually stink bugs. So uh, the first thing is to make sure it's a bug because sometimes bugs and beetles, if you remember your core course, uh, get confused. And so when we look at this insect, we see it has what I called in core course the half and half wings. So that first pair is kind of leathery and then the tip of it has those kind of fly-like wings. That makes it a true bug. If you flip it over, you see needle-like mouth parts as opposed to the mandibles or jaws that beetles have. So that's a true bug. So when we look for a stink bug, uh, look at the shape of it. That can be helpful. It's in my mind kind of shield shape and actually another name for a stink bug is shield bug. And it's kind of uh, like the shape of like a shield or like a, like a badge, like a policeman's badge. You know, not exactly. Of course, obviously, it depends on the badge of the shield you're looking at, but it, but it is kind of a robust looking insect. Now, what's going to really set it off, though, is look in the center of that bug. There's this kind of big triangular plate. I call that to scutellum, but if you just remember that big triangular plate, it's large on stink bugs. And that's how we'll recognize what a stink bug is. Okay, so now that we're, we got a stink bug, now how do we recognize brown marbureated stink bug. Well, it, it's a brown color, okay. Um, there are lots of stink bugs that are brown as well. It is kind of mottled. In fact, marmorated, if you're not familiar with that word, actually means mottled. That was a new word for me, actually. And uh, we can see on the, uh, let's see, we can see on the side, there's some kind of black and white banding that can help 
but it's not definitive. There are some other stink bugs that can look like that. Um, the uh, sh shoulders are kind of rounded. That will help some. It will at least uh, um, kind of exempt certain uh, stink bugs. But that's still, there's still some other things that we will confuse with it. So now, if you look at the veins on the, on the tip of the wings, they're, they're very dark and kind of thick. That starts to help us to identify brown marmor to stink bug. Another very important feature is white banding on the antennae. Always look for that, and that will help you identify a brown marmor to stink bug. Now, if you are still not sure, the best thing to do is flip it over. And you can see a series of like little dimples along the edge of the body and on the, on the legs. And we look at that more closely, we can see uh, iridescent little pits. And they're kind of like little greenish or kind of maroon color. That would be definitive for brown marmory stink bug. And there won't be any doubt. So as I said, there are some lookalikes. So here we have a couple of true bugs, not beetles or bugs, but they are not stink bugs. And we know that uh, from the shape. Now, these are actually both big insects, but we can see they're not quite as robust. But then the main thing is look for that scutellum. Look on the Western conifer seed bug and uh, there's a shape and then really small. And on the uh, squash bug, it's, it's not nearly as large. The other thing with the Western conifer seed bug, and this is probably the most common non-stink bug to get accused of being brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, if you look on the legs, you get that leaf-like enlargement. And that's, that's real typical because this belongs to a family of insects called leaf-footed bugs. And so very appropriately named. And uh, this is also important because we're gonna talk about how brown marmorated stink bug can come into homes in the fall. And you see them throughout the fall and the winter. Western conifer seed bugs do that too. I've already found one in my house. And uh, some of you might have found these at one time or another in your own homes. All right, well, let's look at some common native stink bugs. And so if we look first at the spine soldier bug, it's brown. It actually has that black and white banding on the edge of the abdomen. But look at those uh, shoulders, nice and pointed, as opposed to the round shoulders that we saw in brown marmorated. So, uh, that disqualifies it. If you look at the antennae, it lacks the uh, banding. Uh, it also lacks the, those black veins. Uh, and so that, that should be a pretty easy one to distinguish. When we look at rough stink bug, uh, the shoulders are not quite as rounded as we saw with brown marmorated stink bug. And uh, further, we actually see some teeth kind of on the neck of it. So that will help tell us that it's not brown marmorated sink bug. Now, where we start getting in some really closely looking stink bugs is dusky stink bug. And you can see it's brown. It's got the black and white banding on the edge of the abdomen. Um, what it doesn't have is the banding on the antennae. And, and although it might be a little hard to see in this picture, it doesn't have the black veins uh, on the wings. And again, if you had any doubt, flip it over and look for those pits on the underside. So this is a nice uh, document that the Minnesota Department of Agriculture puts out. It puts all the insects in actual size, or not actual size, but they're all the same size relative to each other. And uh, you can see there are some differences in size. Uh, size is not always a good way to distinguish them. Um, it might be helpful, but, but you can see there are a lot of brown stink bugs. And so just remember the features that we talked about and uh, that will help you recognize them. So what do brown marmor stink bugs do that we don't like? Well, they feed on sap and uh, they feed on over 170 plants uh, here in the United States. Now, practically speaking, this insect is more of a, uh, crops pest. So it's going to get into things like soybeans, tomatoes, apples. And so growers are going to have a more uh, challenge, challenging problem with this insect than maybe people uh, who have landscapes. But that's not to say they can't do damage. And so the upper right-hand picture 
that's a stink bug feeding through the bark on elm. And you know, one or two bugs are not gonna create a problem. If you have large numbers or the more you have, the more sap they feed on, and then the more likely they can weaken plants, um, damage them. Now, as I mentioned before, this insect is also a pest in structures. And if you see one at this time of the year, a stink bug that's in your home, uh, virtually a lock that it's a brown marmoted stink bug. I don't think I've ever seen a native stink bug come into a home. It'd be a kind of a freak thing if it did, but especially if you have more than one brown marmoted stink bug. And this uh, sign just happens to be actually from a few years ago. I was in a conference in Tennessee and they were actually warning uh, the people who were staying there that uh, you might see some stink bugs or some lady beetles, but not to be worried about it. All right. Well, let's talk about another emerging insect, and this is Viburnum leaf beetle. And uh, if, if you are not familiar with this insect or had not heard it, I would not be all that surprised because this is a fairly new insect here. In fact, it was only found for the first time last year in 2019. And it was found in Golden Valley in Hennepin County, and it was found in a couple sites in Dakota County. Now in 2020, it was found in additional sites, including in Ramsey County, uh, including St. Paul. So uh, if you've got viburnum, you might want to be keeping an eye on it. And uh, uh, it will not surprise me if, you're, if you don't see that eventually. And so they feed on a wide variety of different species of, of viburnum. Uh, the susceptibility to it does vary somewhat. Um, they are particularly going to go after things like American and European high bush cranberry, arrowwood viburnum, downy arrowwood, et cetera. And so, so a lot of that are susceptible. So uh, unless you got one that is really known to not be attacked at all, uh, keep a, a sharp eye out on your viburnum. So this is what the adult and the larvae look like. They both feed on the leaves. And the adult is a kind of a smallish insect, kind of a, a golden grayish color. It's kind of the same shape as an elm leaf beetle, if you have seen those. Um, of course, that is kind of greenish yellow with black stripes, and, and particularly the elm. Uh, this is probably the only beetle like this that you're going to see on viburnum. Uh, the larvae is kind of a yellowish greenish or greenish yellowish with a series of spots and dashes um, on the body. And so those would be the insects to look for. And, and between the adults and the larvae, these things are out all spring and summer. So you will be able to find at least some stage at some point. Now, in addition to the insects themselves, you might find evidence on your twigs. And when they lay eggs on the twigs, uh, you can see it has this kind of raised feature where the uh, eggs uh, have been laid. And then when they hatch in the spring, you can see on the left, it creates some kind of empty pits where the eggs were. So really at any time of the year, you can go and look for either the empty pits, or if you're looking in the spring, look for kind of those raised, uh, you know, that raised kind of ridge on it. So the uh, larvae skeletonize, and so kind of similar to Japanese beetles, and uh, their, their feeding is a little bit more random perhaps. And so skeletonizing, they're feeding on the leaf tissue between the major veins. And uh, you can see the damage on the left. They can see larvae on the right. And again, if you see this damage, look more closely because the odds are you will see uh, one of the stages of the insects there. Now the adults actually make a little bit different damage. They are actually chewing small oval holes in the leaves. And so that, that would be how you would recognize them. So either the skeletonizing or the oval holes. So actually, let me go back. Let me go back to here. I don't mean to go backwards, but um, just another word on the skeletonizing. So I mentioned this is similar to Japanese beetles. Japanese beetles actually pretty infrequently attack by burnum. I have never seen them. I had colleagues who say every once in a while they will. So if you see that kind of damage, I would anticipate by burnum leaf beetle. But again, look for them. Uh, look for the actual insects to actually verify what you have. All right. Our next uh, invasive species uh, that is in the emerging classification is European chafer. And uh, 
that is something that just was found this year. It was confirmed in July. We actually were finding specimens in June. And uh, so this is a brand new pest. And so the beetle itself is about a half inch in size, kind of reddish brown. The color can vary somewhat. It does look kind of similar to uh, May June beetles. We'll look at a diagram and compare them. They have a really interesting biology because the odds are you may not actually see these beetles or it's a lot harder to see them compared to something like Japanese beetles. And so they come out late in the evening and then they are active at night and they are basically swarming uh, on trees and shrubs. I had a, uh, a person who's in our department uh, uh, contact me and she was wondering what these beetles were. And she said they were going between uh, their tree and their home and then just going back and forth and just kind of this frenzy. Well, that's what they do. So the biology is really important. I think you can kind of uh, identify it just from that. Let's look at uh, some diagrams here. Now, we don't have all of these insects here in Minnesota. So first we have European Schaefer, again, that kind of reddish brownish, and you can see the size, the bar on the right-hand side. And then we can compare that with uh, May-June beetles. You can see it, they're generally a little darker and they're generally a little larger, but that may not always be the best way to identify them. Now, of course, the other scarab beetle that we have is Japanese beetles. I don't think there should be any problems confusing that with uh, European Schaefer. Uh, they are also out in the middle of the daytime and they do not try to hide as opposed to European Schaefer. But that's, that's what to look for if uh, you do find them. And, and they are out basically in June and July, European Schaefer. Now, uh, interestingly, actually let's back up again, European Schaefer does not cause any damage. They don't even feed. So we're like, and wow, hallelujah, here we have an invasive species that doesn't do any damage. Well, at least not to trees and shrubs. However, the larvae is gonna be very damaging. We'll talk about that. Now, if you were to look at a European Schaefer grub or a larva, you, from this angle, could not distinguish it between a Japanese beetle larva or a made June beetle larva. Uh, they all have kind of that reddish, brownish, or in this case, reddish kind of yellow head. It's bent in that C shape, um, which is conspicuous of all grubs in that uh, group of insects. And so you have to look at what we call the rastral pattern. Now, I'm not necessarily suggesting that's what you need to do, but to properly identify it, that is what needs to be done. So you're thinking, what's a rastral pattern? Well, it's a series of spines and hairs that's on the underside of the tip of the grub. And so if you look at the upper left, you can see as we're looking at the grub from the side, it's right, like I said, kind of on the other side, right at the tip. And so these patterns though are fairly distinctive. If, if you have enough magnification and you know what you're looking for. So European Schaefer, just for example, what really stands out is in the center of it, you have these, this kind of looks like a zipper, like a zipper that's kind of opening up. That would be your European Schaefer. Now, if we compare that with a May-June beetle, it's very similar. It also has that kind of zipper pattern, but it's much more parallel. And so again, there's some differences in size, but that's not reliable. Uh, Japanese beetles, it's a little hard to see in this particular picture, but they have more of a V shape. Uh, on their, on their uh, rasters. And so um, knowing what you have would be important for how you would control them. And so uh, I guess my best suggestion if you have uh, grubs like this is uh, you know try to get them to the U and, and get them identified. And as I mentioned, uh, the adults don't damage, but the grubs are very damaging. In fact, they are considered more damaging than Japanese beetle grubs because they start feeding sooner and they feed longer than Japanese beetles. So that's, uh, you know, we've not got any reports of uh, grub damage yet, um, although we've seen a few cases of suspected uh, grubs and we're just getting started with this and where this takes us, it's hard to say, but I, I know this is in Wisconsin and it's not a huge problem at this point. And so I, I guess our hopes is it's not gonna take off real quickly but definitely do keep this in mind that this is yet another invasive insect pest that's just starting out and starting to be a problem here in Minnesota. All right, 
Now, I wish I could see a show of hands, but how many of you heard a lily leaf beetle? I'm going to have to actually answer that. But yet another uh, emerging insect, invasive insect, that is really pretty brand new. And uh, interestingly, I started to uh, do a talk on invasive insects for uh, some uh, recertification talks for uh, turf and ornamental uh, landscape applicators. And I had put this on the program, but it was before it was actually found here. And uh, it was primarily found in the Northeast. We were finding it in uh, the upper Midwest. It was found in Wisconsin, close to the Minnesota border. So I thought, well, we'll see this you know, at some point. Well, little did I realize that sometime was this year. And so it was found in St. Paul. So again, you guys are in the right county to be finding this. Uh, in, in 2020 of this year. So, and you can see there's kind of an outlier out in Washington. So it can get moved around pretty readily. So it could really pop up pretty much uh, anywhere. Now this will be an easy insect to identify. Bright red, black head, black antennae, black legs. And when you look at the, the body, there are no spots, no stripes, no markings of any sort. So I cannot think of anything you would confuse this with. And if you couple that with it being on, uh, on lilies, and we'll talk about its exact coast plants here in a second, uh, then certainly you're gonna have lily leaf beetle. And this is active pretty much throughout the growing season. So you expect to find this really at any given time. And so the uh, larvae um, will also feed on the leaves. And uh, they're kind of slug-like. You can see this kind of orangish looking body. You can see a dark colored head. And what's interesting about these insects is that, and, and there's other leaf beetles that will do this too, but they will cover themselves up with their own poop, their own excrement. You can see that in the bottom picture. And use that for camouflage to fool birds, I suppose. Well, it might fool us as gardeners too. So if you see holes in, in lily leaves, and all you see is what looks like poop. Look closer, you might be seeing some lily leaf beetle larvae. And these, these are active uh, spring to basically early summer. And so uh, as I said, they feed on true lilies. They feed on frillaries. So they're their absolute favorite plants. They can, to an extent, feed on lily of the valley and Solomon seal. That's not their favorite, but they can feed on it. So don't be surprised if you see damage on, on those. Um, and despite the names, they actually are not interested at all in day lilies, canna lilies, or calla lilies. So, so don't be looking there. They, in addition to the leaves, they can actually feed on pretty much the entire plant. Uh, they feed on the stems, the flower buds, the flowers. And so all of the plant is really susceptible to feeding by the adults or the larvae. And uh, you can see here, this one is not looking too good. It's pretty chewed up. And so, you know, again, it's kind of a numbers game. The more uh, insects you have on it, the more damage they can cause to the plant and uh, certainly can uh, injure it. Uh, if you have enough feeding, it might even kill it. So definitely keep an eye out for uh, lily leaf beetles. All right, well, now we are going to talk about uh, some new invasive insects. And so what I mean by new is that they don't occur in Minnesota but it's something that we could easily find in Minnesota. So definitely something to uh, keep an eye out for. So the first insect we will talk about here is Asian longhorn beetle. And uh, this is an insect, uh, as I said, is not in Minnesota. It's not in a lot of states, it's in six states. It's actually in Toronto, uh, Canada. So one Canadian province, uh, first found in New York in 1996, found in Chicago in 1999. And then it you know, was found in uh, New Jersey, Massachusetts. It was found in Ohio in like, I don't know, 2012 or something. But it was found just this year in South Carolina, 2020. So just when you think there's not gonna be any more, you know, they pop up. And it's, it's interesting because when they do kind of genetic studies on this, now if, you, if you think about emerald ash borer, if we find one in a new county, it undoubtedly is because they got moved from an infested county to a new county. Well, that apparently is not the case here with Asian longhorn beetle. And so all of these sites were apparently individually new introductions. 
So it's not a matter of it went from New York to Chicago and Chicago to New, Jer New Jersey. You know, it's not working like that. In fact, there is also a number of cases where it got intercepted in warehouses. And so this just shows you where they became infested in the landscape. So uh, actually the closest it's been to Minnesota was it was found in a warehouse in uh, Wisconsin. So it, it can clearly and definitely be found here in, in Minnesota. Now, the interesting thing here is that while we would never dream of eradicating emerald ash borer, I mean, we tried and miserably failed, there actually has been some really good success. Uh, it has been eradicated in Chicago, uh, lots of parts of New York, um, Toronto. And so, so there is hope if we were to find it in Minnesota that we could eradicate it. And of course, what that means is the sooner we see it, the faster it's discovered, the better chance we have to, uh, to eradicate it and eliminate it. So um, here's why we should definitely be worried here in Minnesota. So emerald ash borer only feeds on ash trees. Of course, in Minnesota, that's almost a billion ash trees. Uh, but if we look here, Asian longhorn beetles will actually feed on like 15 or plants in 15 different plant groups. And of course, what kind of heads the list are things like maple and box elder. Um, they're perfectly happy with illow, willow and elm. You can see other things like birch, buckeye. And there was a um, kind of a, it uh, wasn't a study per se, but just kind of an observation that probably one in three trees in the United States is probably susceptible to Asian longhorn beetle. But it's really kind of a marvel that we have not found them in more places or they've not become more of a problem. But the potential is definitely there. So how do we identify Asian longhorn beetle? Well, it's, it's a kind of a longhorn beetle and that's a very common native group of insects here in Minnesota. And of course, because of that, uh, um, that name, you can expect they have really long antennae and they can be as long as the body as we see with the female or it can be like half again as long as we see with the male. Uh, the insects themselves are large, up to an inch and a half, and they have a really glossy black color. And that to me really stands out. And in addition to the, the glossy black color, they have lots of white spots. In fact, kind of a, another name for it is the starry sky beetle. And uh, that's perfectly understandable because it looks like you're looking up at a starlit sky. Um, it also has white banding on the antennae that will help us identify this. And if you look at kind of the feet or the legs, they're kind of bluish. That can also help also. Now, most native longhorn beetles will not be confused with the Asian longhorn beetle, but there is one that will. And I do get questions on this pretty much every year. And so if this is something that uh, you get a question on, this would be the first thing for you to be suspicious of. And so this is the white spotted Sawyer. This is also, it's, it's a good inch. Uh, it approaches an inch and a half. So a very similar size. You can see it has a white banding on the antennae. So that's not a good way to distinguish it. it uh, it's kind of a grayish black. So the, the, you might use that, although I have seen some Asian longhorn beetles that are not quite as glossy black as this, but that might help you. It does have white spots. Uh, the spots to me, are not quite as well defined, so that might help you. But what's going to be more definitive is going to be the white spot. You can see the arrow pointing to it right behind the head, kind of right where the wing covers meet. And that's where it gets its name white spotted. Now, for all the spots that are on the Asian longhorn beetle, it lacks a spot right in that little area. And you can see the arrow there, uh, right where that little piece is. And so let's look at the larvae uh, up to uh, two inches in size. And uh, they're very cylindrical. In fact, this belongs to a group of beetles called round-headed borers. And like emerald ash borer, the head is not very obvious. Uh, it's kind of just pushed into the front of the head or the front of the body. Uh, you can, in this case, see the mandibles really clearly, but that would be what you'd have to look for. Now, when you look at the tail of it, where, where as we saw those little pinchers, uh, those little tails, the uh, Asian longhorn beetle larva lacks that completely. So uh, there are other native borers that we can find that are about this size, 
but they will all have some sort of little tail. This will not. So that will really help you to identify Asian longhorn beetle. And, and again, you know, it'll be great to see the, if you can see the insects, um, they're, they're very conspicuous, but you are probably more likely to see symptoms first. And probably the most obvious are the exit holes. Now we didn't talk about that with emerald ash borer because they're kind of small and they're kind of inconspicuous and not very noticeable, but here they're quite large and, and they're round. And so you can see here, it's large enough, you can stick a pencil in it. Now there's some, there's some literature that will compare to the size of a dime. That's an exaggeration. If you put a dime next to that, that's much larger. So don't go by that. But as I said, if you can put a pencil in it, uh, then you clearly have, you'd be highly suspicious that it's Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, another really common symptom is a, a sawdust-like material that we see in the right-hand picture. And uh, that's called frass. And so frass is a combination of kind of sawdust plant material, uh, uh, fecal material poop, and that's all combined to be called frass. As the larva tunnels through the tree, it kicks out this frass out of the tunnels. Emerald ash borer actually packs it into the, the galleries that they create, but Asian longhorn beetle will push it out. And so if you see accumulation of sawdust-like stuff in the crotches of branches or at the bottom, the base of the trees, especially if we're talking a susceptible tree like a maple, very suspicious of Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, the other thing that you'll see, and I think you'll see these other things first, but you'll also see a series of pits called egg niches. And this is where uh, the adults will uh, chew and then eventually lay her eggs. Um, and again, that, that will help kind of verify it, but I think you'll see these other things first. All right, well, the, the last insect we're gonna talk about, and I wasn't gonna include this at first, but I thought, no, this is an invasive insect and we can call this new because it's not here in Minnesota. And, uh, but I'm gonna bet a lot of you got questions. I know I sure did. So we're talking about invasive giant hornet. And so uh, you might hear this being called the Asian giant hornet uh, or the, the uh, media calls it murder hornets. And there's not an official common name to it. And uh, in a, a working group uh, that, that talks about invasive species, uh, one of the topics that we talk about is trying to get away from using geographic names to describe uh, invasive species. And you don't have to really go much further than the coronavirus when it was being called the Asian virus to realize that that's kind of counterproductive in some cases. And so when I say Asian giant hornets, and this is what I'm talking about. <clears throat> and so, but this is an insect that is native to Japan. It is found other places in, uh, in Asia. I know it's in Korea, China, amongst other places. And this was found in North America for the first time in 2019, so just last year, it was in the Pacific Northwest. It was found in Washington State in December, and it turns out that it was also found in British Columbia in June. And so they uh, looked for nests. Um, they, you know, tried to destroy, you know, the the hornets that they found, um, and then they were kind of waiting. And unfortunately, there were survivors. There was at least one nest that did survive because they did find not only hornets in 2020, but mated queens. So that means that they had a mating swarm and that they went off to find other nests. And so they're in the process now of, of looking for these nests. Actually, a novel thing that they're trying is capturing these hornets live, trying to put like a little tiny transmitter on it and then let it go and hopefully it'll take it back to the nest. I've not heard anything else uh, recently as far as the status of this, uh, as, as far as if they have found any nests or not, but they are looking very uh, diligently. And so why is this important? Well, they are honeybee predators. And so people who uh, raise honeybees uh, stand to uh, lose a lot. And they go into a colony, 30 invasive giant hornets can destroy a honeybee colony of 30,000 in less than four hours. Uh, obviously they're bigger, but they're very aggressive and they get in there and they basically chop their heads off, they decapitate them. 
Now, of course, they can sting people and it is a very painful sting. In Asia, uh, there's a handful of people that die every year from multiple stings from this. So that certainly is a problem. Uh, our issue with uh, invasive giant hornets is gonna be more of the honeybee industry. So as if they were not having enough problems as it was, uh, they're going to have to face this potentially. So let's talk about how we identify this um, because it's not gonna be so much that we're likely to see it. We wanna be able to distinguish other things from it. So the first thing that stands out is it is big, an inch and a half to two inches. This is bigger than our uh, Asian longhorn beetle that we talked about. Um, I, uh, you know, as, uh, we're going to talk about cicada killers. Cicada killers are about an inch, inch to maybe an inch and a half. So it's that much larger than a cicada killer. And, and, and my experience always is, it's one thing to look at a specimen dead. But one thing is alive and especially flying. It looks twice as big, maybe three times as big. So we see it has a dark colored body, got a black and yellow striped abdomen. What's going to really stand out is that yellow head with big black eyes. That yellow head is going to really help tell us Asian longhorn, uh, I'm sorry, Asian longhorn beetle, invasive giant hornet. So let's take a look at uh, a nice diagram that uh, Washington State Department of Agriculture put out. So if we look here in the center, there is our Asian, well, they have Asian giant hornet here, our invasive giant hornet. And, uh, you know, they're all size wise relative to each other. And so you can see that everything is a little bit smaller, including our cicada killer on the top. Um, the the horn tail or the uh, pigeon tremex on the bottom kind of approaches that. If you're familiar with a megarissa, which is the giant ichneumonids, that would be body-wise the same size, probably a little bit larger, and certainly with the ovipositor, larger still. So that might be something that people might confuse. Um, I found that there were two things people were confusing it with. When this story first came out in, it was like April, May, um, and starting in May and into June, I was getting a ton of questions about elm sawfly. It must have been a good year because I don't get that many questions, but especially because people were concerned. And, and that's fine because we, if it's going to be in this state, we do want to know about it. Uh, and so that was in the spring. Then of course come uh, late July, August, then it was cicada killers. Now, of course, they lack that yellow head with the big black eyes. They're, they're not nearly the same size, but uh, you know, anything uh, is wasp-like and flying, people are gonna want, you're gonna ask. Better to say, no, it's not, than to find out later that something was. Now, if you look in the top row all the way to the right, there is a, an insect called a European hornet. And that is actually nothing we have in Minnesota either. It's, it's related, it's actually the same genus, but you can see there's a considerable difference in size. That's more the size of our, our cicada killer. So it would be an impressive wasp if it was here, bigger than our, our yellow jackets, but uh, nothing, that, that's more of an Eastern insect, nothing that's gotten to Minnesota. All right, so uh, what is the impact uh, here to Minnesota? Well, I guess the good news is it's, it's unlikely to be found here anytime in the near future. And, you know, it's in a very limited uh, area or areas in Washington state. Uh, I mean, it would have to get packed and, and accidentally brought here. And that's pretty doubtful that's going to happen. Um, and not impossible because insects don't always read the book about what they're supposed to be doing. I would just say it's unlikely. And it's also kind of unclear how they can, how able they are to survive Minnesota winters. And boy, that is, that is one good thing. We would have that many more invasive species if uh, we had warmer weather, but because we do get down to 20, 30 below and colder, depending where you live, uh, it does render some species just unable to survive here. And so, yeah, you know, I guess we will not know until someone does maybe some studies on them or they actually get here. Um, as I mentioned, they are confused with native species. So your task is probably going to see what native species they're actually seeing and then reassure them that it is not giant invasive a hornet. Now, uh, some of you may have read back when this came out in, um, uh, in early May, but if 
you didn't, or if you did see, but you want to read it again, uh, between myself and Elaine Evans and uh, Katie Lee, uh, all in the uh, B Lab, the three of us actually wrote a really interesting article on this invasive giant hornet. And so uh, they talked more from the honeybee point of view, and and you know I I talked about uh, you know just uh, identification and some other related things. And so you know go ahead and reread that. So if you go to the extension site and just type in giant hornet, it'll pop up, and then you can go ahead and read it. So uh, the, I'm going to end this uh, here by by uh, describing if you find something that you think is an invasive species, there are ways to report that, and you you definitely should. And so there's there's basically three ways to do this. You can go to the uh, Great Lakes Early Detection Network, like uh, Glendon, and that's an app that you can download to your phone. So really neat. You you take a picture of it, you submit it. Um, it will give GPS location, and then they'll tell you what it is, what, you know, whether it's an invasive species or not. And if it is, it gets put into their, their database. Uh, EdMaps is a uh, online uh, web service or website. And similarly, you can submit suspected insects or, or other species. This actually is all invasive species, including things like plants, uh, jumping worms, et cetera. But then you can submit it, and then they will identify it. And they also have a good database for just uh, where invasive species have been found uh, in the country or in a state. Um, they also have little, like, uh, little fact sheets on different uh, invasive species. And so lots of really great information. Now, if those don't work for you, you can always contact MDA and go through Arrest the Pest. And we've got the uh, website where you can go to it and submit it. Uh, you can email them. You can call them and, and leave a message. The uh, Clendon and EdMaps are preferred, but uh, they would rather have you do it through a rest of pest and not do it at all. So uh, with that, that is the end of my presentation. And so uh, do you want me to stop sharing the screen, give you control back? Um, I don't really know the answer to that. I think we're... Uh, otherwise, you're going to stare at the screen until I do. <laughs> well, that's uh, fine. We do have a, a line you know, of you know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. Let me back up here. We'll leave it on here for a few minutes. And then if there are any questions in the chat box or if anyone wants to articulate a question, we can do that uh, till like 8 o'clock. And then uh, and we'll, we'll call it a, a program. Yeah. Okay, so we do have a few questions that came in. Um, okay. Again, awesome presentation. I did notice I started putting some links in the chat as you were talking. The Glendon uh, app is only on it, it looks like. I don't see it for iOS, just to let people know. So the questions that came up, um, we're going back to the beginning. We'll talk about Emerald Ash Borer. If, you, if we come across a, a tree that is exhibiting symptoms and has been for a while, is there anything that we can and should be doing about that? Well, if you're in Ramsey County, I mean, you're already, already under quarantine. <laughs> and so, so it's, I mean, as opposed to counties where they don't know it to be. And, and so if it's, if this is a tree that looks like it's not going to make it, then you're best to take it down as soon as possible because when ash trees die, they become very brittle and it becomes that much more difficult and dangerous to take them down. And it's so much better to take them out uh, while they're still alive. Now, if it's infested, but it still has at least 50% of the canopy, you can in theory save it. Uh, through insecticides. Uh, you would have to question though, uh, you would have to probably, for me, you would probably have to have more of its canopy, but in theory, you, you can save it if, uh, if it has at least 50, 60% of the canopy, but it's gonna take a while before the canopy really recovers. What if it's not our tree? Okay, um, hopefully it's somebody that you know and you can uh, feel free to, to talk with them. And, uh, uh, and maybe they're, they don't know they have emerald ash borer, and that would be an opportunity to, uh, 
talk to them and explain what they have and uh, explain what their options are. And, and, I, and I guess one thing I would say is, you know, when I talk about report suspected invasive species, it's really not necessary for the most part to uh, report uh, infestations in Ramsey County. Now, what you could do is if you go to the MDA website and, and go to the Emerald Ash Borer page, they will have an interactive map that will show where it has been reported. And you can type in an address and it will show you where the nearest infestations are. And so if it's significantly far away, then it would be worth reporting. But if it's like one block away from known infestations and it's not necessary to report that. Okay. So then I'm um, gonna move on to the brown marmorated uh, squash bug or um, stink, bug. stink bug. You mentioned that one of the ways that it travels is I noticed there's a lot of clusters in the metro area and fewer outstate. Is this case like, for example, this year with so many people taking field trips out to state parks, is that one of the ways that this insect is being moved? And have you heard of any way that travelers can try to prevent that kind of hitchhiking? So the first thing I would say there is that they are probably most likely to get to a vehicle uh, in the fall time when they're seeking shelter. Um, but of course, any time that there's a lot of them and they fly to the vehicle, and they're still interested in feeding. So they're, they're not probably going to be hitching rides at that point. But uh, I, I mean, can that happen? I mean, let's say last weekend, could they have gone into a vehicle and, and gotten moved? I, I mean, it's possible. Uh, I think for like a car, you're likely to notice it. I think something like a RV or a, a semi a trailer, I mean, you're more likely to get them in something like that and not realize it and then haul it off uh, than say like a small vehicle. So, but, uh, but and I, I would not say that the risk is any different this year than say any other year, because people are still driving around. I, maybe they're doing it more this year, but uh, I think the risk is, would still be similar. Okay. Uh, we had a question also about the, the stink bug. The, uh, on the underside, the little, the spots that you pointed out, or are they actual glow, uh, globes or dimples or bumps? Um, the question was, can those be seen without a microscope? Are they common to the, just to the eye? It depends on your eyesight. <laughs> uh, you know, if you flip it over, you, you can see something is there. <clears throat> if you have a hand lens, you'll be able to zoom in that much closer. And I, you know, when we looked at that, obviously I had the really close up picture that showed the, the, the dimples of the pits really close up. But in the other picture, when you're <clears> looking at it more like this, you can uh, see that there is kind of like some freckling around there. So you would see that something was there. If you look at a native sink bug and flip it over, I mean, you won't see anything remotely like that. So a hand lens will help. But uh, I, I think you can reasonably see that if you've got decent eyesight. Okay. And then would it be possible to get a, a copy of that lookalike chart for the uh, brown marmorated stink bug for our diagnostic clinic? Because that was a great chart. And I haven't seen yep. that one. That, I've seen its Emerald Ash Borer cousin, but not this one. I mean, that's a Minnesota Department of Agriculture uh, handout. And so you can go to their website. Okay. Um, you can go to the website and download it, but you know what? You could contact them and ask them for a stack of them, and I bet you they'll send you some. That would be great. Uh, so a question in general about the invasive insects. Do we have an idea about where they're coming from originally? How, what, what is their home like, and what are they coming over here on or with? So, I mean, we do have a, a pretty good idea. I mean, there are a decent number of them that come from Asia. Uh, but that's not to say there aren't some from Europe, because there are. Viburnum leaf beetle uh, comes from Europe. And, uh, you know, they're, they're coming through commerce for the most part. So um, when, uh, you know, cargo ships come in and in crates or dunnage or, or things like that, uh, they're going to accidentally gotten packed in or if they're boars, they could actually be, you know, in the wood. And so that that's likely how uh, they're being brought over. Okay. Uh, during the the year, is there any general guideline about when we should be particularly alert about 
new invasive species? Hmm. Or is it not all for, fair game? Yeah, yeah not, not for new invasive species in general. If you're targeting a specific one, I talked about the life cycle a little bit or when you could expect the life stages. And uh, you know, so you can use that for specific ones, but really for just in general, uh, I mean, any time is game, any time it's warm out, warm out enough for them to be flying around. Okay. And then um, a question again about just kind of in general, especially when we're looking at these possible new insects arriving, since they're not currently in Minnesota, what kind of resources would you recommend for identifying them? Um, one of our master gardeners said there was, she had some trouble identifying the red lily leaf beetle because it's not a Minnesota insect. So it wasn't on any of our resources. Right, well, we're trying to rectify that as they come into the state and try to get publications up. Probably the go-to, well, I don't wanna say the go-to source until Extension has something up. Probably your best resource would be the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And they generally have uh, pages uh, for everything as they come in. A lot of times before they're actually uh, uh, located and, and actually determined to be in the state. So like we would go to the Minnesota Department of Ag to look for that spotted lanternfly, for example? Yes. Okay. Yes, I didn't talk about spotted lanternfly. That is another one I could have talked about if we had more time. Um, that is a new insect. It's not here in Minnesota. It's actually just in a very few places out east. Um, I, part of the reason I didn't talk about it because it uh, reproduces on the tree of heaven. And that's something that is not hardy here in Minnesota. So it's actually a pretty low risk that they'll even get here. But, but that's not to say people won't ask questions about it or, or you might see something that looks like it. But if that's the case, MDA has a page on it, I believe. Excellent. And uh, the last question we had from the group was about the, the, um, um, the murder hornets. Um, oh, yeah. We know that they, they attack uh, honeybees. Is there any known risk to native bees or uh, bumblebees or smaller colony bees? Not to my knowledge. And I don't remember that's something that <laughs> Katie or Elaine uh, talked about. They might have. So you might double check that May 5th article. I don't believe so because um, it's not really it's not really worth their time, frankly. Because our native bees, with the exception of bumblebees, are are solitary, or for most of them are solitary. And so, you know, when you got a big colony of honeybees, and you can go in there and eat to your heart's content. That's a lot different than uh, some of these smaller size bees and just bees that are are uh, you know are the only individual in the nest. Now, I don't know about bumblebees. It's, it's maybe not impossible they would attack bumblebees, but I would have to either check that article or check with Elaine or Katie on that one. Honeybees is their favorite though, without a doubt. Is it because they're filled with honey? Uh, what's that? <laughs> it said, is it their favorite because honeybees are filled with honey and they're oh. filled <laughs> Well, that's my reason, but I don't think it's their reason. <laughs> Jeff, there well, was some of the the I questions just, that I, I collected. Did you have more, Darren? I was just going to say, Jeff, there were several comments thanking you for all the good work that you're doing with the university and with Extension. You have always been a good resource for master gardeners and um, just continue to recommend keeping us all in mind when it comes to outreach to our Ramsey County residents and beyond. So uh, thank you again for all your good work. Well, and I, I appreciate that. And right now I'm, I'm trying to write and revise as many fact sheets or pages as possible. That's where I think the greatest need is. So uh, just not enough time for me to write as much as I would like to, but, but I'm working on it. Thank you again. All right, I'm gonna stop.